Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you, Thomas, for not overshooting your, ti your time slot. <laughs> um, I'll be talking about build route and how we've been using it uh, for a project I've been working on for the past four years. So my name is Yann Morin, and work, uh, I am working for Orange, which is uh, the historical French telco. Um, uh, in this context, uh, we've been using Beirut, and I will introduce that, and just a few words about myself. So on the left is the Yann Morin you have today to, uh, in front of you, which is doing Linux, embedded security network, and free libre open source software at work. And on the right, the other Yann Morin, which is contributing to build root on his spare time, which has basically the same uh, interest in life. Oh, sorry. So the context of the project, we, the team I'm working on is essentially targeting set-top boxes, the IPTV decoders, um, whether it is production devices, R&D devices, we have uh, various generations of de decoders with various performance points. And one of the most critical uh, issue we have is we inherit constraints from legacy. Um, one of those constraints is that we are only part of the firmware. So the main part of the firmware is provided by the third party. And this third party aggregates others and in the end provides us with a complete firmware. Um, the part of the firmware I'm talking about is a complete rewrite from scratch from an existing application. Um, three teams have been doing that rewrite, about 30 developers for the past four years. One team in Toulouse, south of France, and two other teams in Rennes, west of France, where I, uh, I am located. And they are mostly application developers, definitely not Linux experts. If, they, if you talk to them about syscall, they would just look at you in a weird way. And they are definitely not, a uh, not a embedded dev experts either. So I have to provide them with some tools they can use. So following that, we had uh, to choose a build system for our project, and we had a, requirement, a few requirements. First, we want to use generic solutions. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we want to use something that is not dependent on the target, that is not dependent on the SOC, that is not dependent on the runtime, the type of middleware we have. We want uh, it to be easy to use. We want uh, no build time overhead. We want to use uh, an existing solution. We tried to do with, with our own build system, and I can't say it was a complete success. And most importantly, the choice was not mine. It was a colleague of me, which has gone to the things now. So the first thing we tried to do is investigate the SDK provided by the Softco. And it is what it is. It is dedicated to the production devices. And it's not even the s exactly the same SDK for all the production devices. They are slightly different. So very specific to the production device, very specific to the soft core. We can't do research and development with reference design with that. So it was dismissed. The other solution that was investigated, um, and I will stress that from our point of view, it's not may probably all the story, but what we've seen is that Open Embedded, or is it Yocto, uh, is mostly a distribution generator. It generates firmware images, but as a side effect of being a distribution generator. It, however, is very versatile, highly customizable, but the learning curve is pretty steep, and because the developers are not very experts in Linux, well, not very nice for them. And we didn't have mostly no in-house knowledge about uh, Open Embedded. So it, we put that on the, s on the side for now. The other solution was BuildRoot, which advertises itself as a firmware generator, and that's what we are looking for. It's definitely not a distribution generator. However, it's pretty flexible and pretty extendable, and we'll see how we've, how we've been using BR2 extendables that was introduced by Thomas um, previously. And the learning curve is 
pretty moderate, and some of my colleagues even like were okay to say. So sorry. So my colleagues even said that it was pretty easy to learn. Um, we had some pretty good in-house knowledge of Beirut, yeah, myself. And we quickly dismissed a few other solutions because they did not fit our requirements, mostly probably because they had much smaller community, except maybe OpenWRT. URT. So quick overview of Beirut, of Enzao, Thomas has done a lot of things before. So simple, efficient, and easy to use tool to generate embedded Linux systems through cross compilations. Quite a long sentence to say, but yes, that's what we wanted. We wanted to be able to do cross compilation with an easy to use tool. And basically using build root is just a kind of running make dev config and make, and that's all. And all you get is your the result. It's entirely community driven, which is good solution, which is a good option for us because it is not a custom uh, solution. Uh, it uses kconfig, make files, there's a website and big manual, and I find it pretty fun to work with. And to show that build root, doing a package in build root is pretty easy, we've got here two packages. The first one, LPEG, it is a, it is a Lura Rocks package. So you only need to state the version, and Bilotol will automatically uh, know that how to download, extract, patch, and build it because it is a Lua Rocks package. The licensing information is absolutely not technically relevant, but you need it for the legal information uh, manifest that is generated at the end, and that's very important. LPEG is the simplest package in Beirut, the smallest one. And FPing is the smallest auto tools based package in Beirut. You just provide the version, the website, and Beirut will know how to download, extract, configure, patch, and install it because it is an auto tools package. So unless your, pack unless your package is doing something very weird, writing a package in Beirut is pretty easy. And once you have your packages, Beirut will configure build them in sequence, one after the other, respecting the dependency, dependency chain between your packages. And at the very end, it will do a kind of cleanup pass on the target directory, removing headers, uh, static files, because you don't need them on the target, stripping executables and stuff like that. And once this is done, it generates a file system image for example, a tarball, which is a file system image in build root parlance. And an interesting point is, is you can hook infrastructure hooks at the beginning of the target finalized step. And you can also provide post build strips that are run right at the end of the target finalized hooks and right before generating images. And then you can provide post image strips that are run after your images are generated. I'm not going into the details because that's not the purpose of the talk. But I'll see how we've been using them. And for each package, standard build procedure, uh, which is uh, again interesting, is that for each step, there is a pre hook and post hook. Um, when you're doing actual development on your machine, you can use what we call the override SRCD that does a rsync instead of downloaded, uh, downloading the package. So you have your source tree locally on your laptop or, or, or computer, and Beirut will use that to build your package. So you can do active development with that. And Beirut is also providing what we call a BR2 external uh, OK, ah, it's back. Good, thank you. BR2 external, which allows you to provide extensions to build root, new dev configs, new packages, file system, and stuff like that. And we've been use that, using that quite uh, heavily in uh, our project. So the first thing is the basic of our uh, setup is we are using a BR2 external tree as, the, as a git tree where each commit is buildable. This is the 
reference of our project. So first thing is you create a beer to external, so a very minimalist one, which just needs two empty files, and that's, that is, that's it. You've got a beer to external tree. And then we've been adding a git submodule to contain build root. So every commit of our BR2 external tree will use the correct version of build root. That does not gain us much for now, except we can add new configuration for all our boards. We have a few boards here, development configuration, end-to-end -end configuration, production configurations, a little bit simplified, of course, but you get the idea. Um, some people are using snippets to have basic dev configuration files for describing a board and snippets to describe their software stack. And we've tried to do that, and in the end, it's most interesting to have various dev config files that you update when needed, because they are not updated that often. So manually managing the dev config file is pretty easy because it's a two-way mechanism. You use the dev config file and you modify it and you save it. Using snippets, you can't split a configuration into snippets. You can assemble snippets into a configuration, but kconfig does not, do, does not know how to do the opposite, and that's a problem. So we are also adding new packages, for example, a package to store our live application, which is rendering live uh, streams to the user. Uh, a recorder, PVR, personal video recorder, stuff like that. Totally standard to build packages. You just have to register them in config.in and in external.mk by including them and sourcing the configuration files. Totally standard build root mechanism. Oops, sorry. Something that is interesting also is if your device is using a specific kind of firmware image with a specific format, you can just create a new type of file system. And this is exactly how our file system is generated in Beelroot. Even Beelroot uses the same syntax to create file systems. So it's nothing specific. It's, again, totally Beelroot standard. So here we are using our GP tools, which is tools to manip manipulate our GP image. Yes. And we define the command to generate a file system. It takes a rootfs.tar in input and generates the output. And this registers the file system with build root. Nothing very fancy so far. One thing you can store in your BR2 external tree, and what we are doing as well, is to store what we call board files. Board files are basically whatever does not fit in a package. So for example, the basic skeleton content, it's not the skeleton package, it's only its content here. Some post-build scripts, one which is for production, one which is for test, and a kind of some kind of overlays that build root will copy as is to your target directory at the very end. If you have overlays, try to avoid them. Move packages, sorry, move files out of overlays into packages. If you have fonts, create a package that installs your fonts. If you have a data set, create a package that installs that data set. Files that come from an overlay are not accounted for in various build root infrastructure. So for example, you don't know why your target is big. Maybe all your packages are installing small files, but your data set is big. And the, graph, the graphing infrastructure in build root will not help you. There are other reasons I will uh, explain later. And one big thing is because this external .mk file is included by the build root infrastructure, it has access to all the variables and infrastructure in build root. So you can add extra logic, extra make file logic. You can add additional infrastructure. 
So the first thing to do is adding new infrastructure. For example, make rules. You just write a new make rule in your external load MK. It's not full. Okay. Um, and all those variables are standard variable uh, below variables. And this one is just an example that checks that all the packages in the current configuration build without depending on the build order. It means that all the dependencies of those packages are correct, except may maybe inherited dependencies, but that's not a problem for us. So, sorry. You can provide whatever you want here, as long as it does not clash with existing infrastructure. But there are other places where it is interesting to provide new things. For example, in the target finalized hooks, which is run at the end when all your packages have been installed, you know your target directory is complete, so you can run hooks to do things with that directory. For example, we have a, a tool that will clean elf libraries. At runtime, you don't need the same links to elf libraries. You only need the libraries whose file is named after the so name. So this tool is just getting rid of, rid of same links and renaming the libraries to their so name. You can and you should offload this kind of functionality to help your script, Python or, script or shell, whatever you want, because writing it in make file is not very maintainable and your editors will not help you with syntax highlighting, highlighting so move them to a helper script. Now, we, we have a few requirements for our packages. We want them to do stuff. But we don't want developers to write the same code again and again and again in their .mk files. So we decided to introduce a kind of package infrastructure which allows developers to write standard build root packages without worrying about how the extra features we need will be implemented. So they just have to write a standard build root package here, which is a CMake package with a version, a website where to get it, which is defined here. Defines the licensing, the whether it installs in staging, the dependencies and stuff like that. And call the orange package macro. And so far it does not provide anything very interesting, except packages will build their documentation automatically from now on. But the mere fact of calling this and setting a variable that the package has documentation, all this code will be added as if it was written in the .mk file. Developers don't have to write a hook to build their documentation. It will be done, done automatically. So we use, we defined a new macro for each package that calls make, changes directory to the package source tree slash doc, so it supposedly builds the documentation, and registers a new macro as a post build hook. And the same for the, a macro to install the documentation in a specific directory. This is not very interesting because you define the macro twice, uh, well, sorry, many times, once for, all, for each package that needs to build documentation, which means you have to escape the dollar here because it is inside a macro that is evaluated twice. So you want the variables to only be evaluated the second time, not the first time. So you need to, eva to quote. So we have a first world problem that we have too many dollars. And it's also bad, it's also bad for performance because as you add new macros, uh, you will uh, create clashes in the hash tables internal to make which it uses to find uh, variable definitions. So the more macro and the more variables, the slower it is. So 
Instead, you should do as we've been doing for the translations, define a macro that is absolutely generic and call it, call the same macro for all packages that define translations. So, package that specifies that it has translations, again, it does on only uh, declarative statement, no code is written by the developer, will automatically get that code to be expanded. And if the Qtsfy tool link tool is enabled and the package has translations, it inherits those two uh, macro and one for to as a post build hook to build the translation and one as a post install target hook to actually install the translation files. And the package automatically gains the dependency of Qt5 tools without having to write it itself. That is, if we change the way we handle translations, the package will just have nothing to do because we will change that code once here. And then, because the macros are defined only once, you don't, we don't have the too many dollar problem. It is more readable. So, our applications need to be run by something else, which we call the application manager. And application just register with our application manager by installing two configuration files, one for the application manager itself and one for our window manager, where it tells whether it is a full screen or an overlay application or a pop-up or whatever. And those two files are just static files installed from the package directory to the target directory as a post-install target hook, which is, again, a single macro expanded for all packages. And this macro just copies the file from the current package directory out to the, ta to the target directory and a specific uh, folder. And actually, one reviewing this reviewing the slides and writing them, I noticed that we had a bug here that I had to fix in our code. So do talks to conferences, you can fix your bugs. And actually, I think Stephen Rosted had the same uh, comment this morning or yesterday. We also have various types of applications, those that are run in it time, or those that are run as services or systems, and the same, developers just define the type of application they are installing. For example, here the Orange Live application defines that it is installing live, so live here corresponds to the live here and here. And this means that the application is to be started automatically at boot. But there are also system applications and services. The difference between being when they are started. System is started earliest, services are started early, but after system, and init applications are started last, while other applications are just started on demand later. What we have here is quite complex code that generates a JSON file which contains the list of app init applications, services, and system demons. Uh, don't write that, it's totally not, li not lisible. You could, you could probably write a template and set your values into that template. It would be more easy to read. And this code is registers, uh, registered as a post build hook from our application manager, app env, and installed into the target directory as a post install target hook. What this means here is that, again, developers do not have to write code or uh, we don't have to have static files that describe our applications. Developers just have to, in their .mk file, write whether their, application, their package install applications or not. And this is, again, very easy for them. Writing this kind of code is definitely not easy. And for me, as a maintainer of this packaging, writing static files is not very nice because 
I would have a static file for when the live and the PVR are enabled, or a static file where only the live is enabled, that's not doable in the long term. This package, AppEnv, starts with an A. It means that it is scanned by make very early in the scanning process. However, those variables are only set when a package is passed. So maybe packages that are scanned later will register applic applications. But that's not a problem, because those variables are part of, are part of a post-build hook. So it means they will be evaluated very late. So you can still use variables, even though their values is uh, not yet known. That's make syntax. Build root has a mechanism to define users, and all our applications run as a specific user. And that's good for security, because when an application creates a file on the file system, it belongs to itself, and other applications can't read it. So you have to have various users. However, you, build root allows you to define a user without specifying your UID, and build root will assign it for you. Which means that the live application here will get probably the 10,042 UID, if it is automatic. You run that on the target. The live application creates a file that belongs to the live user, which is UID 10,042. And then you add a new package, let's call it joystick, that declares a joystick user. And because J sorts before L, the joystick user gets the 10,042 UID. And when you update your device, the live user is no longer 10,042. It would be 10,043. And it would have no longer access to its files. And the joystick user would access the live user's file. So we have some code that ensures that all UIDs are explicit. Those are just variables. So they are known at the time of parsing. So you can just do some check on them. And again, this is only declarative code. So the user just has to, sorry, the developer of the package just has to declare a user using normal build root mechanism. Our application call each other through Dbus, and because they are using non-root users, we have to generate an authorization file for each user, which means, for example, this user is allowed to talk to the Dbus and call methods from that interface. And if the user is not allowed to call to a specific interface, the call will fail. However, maintaining this kind of files is very tedious because users may add new calls or new interfaces, and they may remove old ones, so you would have bit rot in those uh, authorization files. So we decided that because we are using Dbus uh, APIs through QDBus, we could scan the code for various known patterns and generate associated uh, authorization files. OK, the code is a little bit complex, but what it does basically is, as a post build hook, it will call this macro, which is just uh, calling a tool that scans the package source tree for a specific UID and generate a system dbus.conf file. And this I'll, I'll cover a bit later. So as a post build hook, we scan the source code and generate configuration files for this specific user. And at install file, at install time, we install them. In target for the session bus and in staging for the system bus. Remember that we are not the main part of the system. So the system bus does not belong to us. It belongs to the main part. So we are not running it. We are not even aware of how it is running. We just know there is a system bus to which we, we, we must provide authorization files. That's why 
we provide them in staging so that we can extract them easier, uh, more easily at the end of the build. But our session bus, we manage, so we install the authorization files in the target directory. Only part of the code is shown here that deals with the system bus, but the session one is uh, about the same. It would not fit on the slide. And again, because packages, all of our packages call this macro orange package, we extend that macro with a new call here, which extends all this code and more for a specific package. And then, what the package has to say, it just has to define that, yes, it is using the system debus API. Nothing more. With a slight exception. When two applications want to talk to each other, sorry, when they want to talk to each other, they need the XML file one of the, the other. And the first that comes loses because the XML of the other is not really present. So we have to break the loop. And an application just writes that it uses extra debus interfaces that are not known by scanning the code because it is not using QDBus. And this is what we have here, extra debus interface. So, scanning the code for the package's own debus API use, and scanning the code for un sorry, added interfaces for the unknown and unscannable interface usage. And there is another exception. When an application uses a library, and that the library uses call to debus, there is no way to scan the code because it's the code of a library. So we have some way for libraries to export the interfaces they use. And because the Orange library depend, depends on the libdata model, it automatically will gain a call, an authorization on this interface. And this is done by this code here that scans the in, in inherited dependencies of the inherited interfaces of all dependencies. So we generate authorization debus config files automatically without the user even knowing what's going on, just by the mere fact of writing this line. Something that is very similar to debus is Apamor. Apamor is a way to constrain an application to a specific set of files it is allowed to use with various writes on a file like read or write, lock, exec, map, and stuff like that. And this is tedious to write because it is a huge list that depends on what libraries you are linked with. For example, your application may use slash proc slash months, and there is absolutely no reason that it does because when you look at your application code, this path is never mentioned in the code. And why does it need that? It needs it because if you are using some kind of uh, shared memory uh, things, the glibc will try to find a tmpfs mount, and for that, it needs to scan slash proc slash months. But the application developer does not know about that. And even himself is not using shared memory. It's being used, for example, for Welland, and he's just writing an application. So, yeah, it's quite tedious to work, to, to write, but most importantly, it's very prone to bit rot in case a library changes or a developer uses new files or removes access to a file from his application. So, it's pretty difficult to maintain a security feature, which, is, which goes contrary to security itself. So we've added a way for an application to define that it installs an executable to be protected by Aparmor, and that the specific snippet for that application is provided here. And this application just requires an access to a file in read mode and an access to another file in read, write, and lock mode. And that's all a developer has to write. 
However, when an application has a dependency on a library, which itself needs some access to files, libraries just define what library should provide upper snippets. And this library, DataModel, needed to read its configuration file and access to its socket. And by c because the live application is linked to the libDataModel library, it will pull in this snippet automatically. And the same goes for data files. For example, the fonts here specify that it installs data files to be used by other Apparmore protected executables. And in this case, all TTF files in that directory are loaded in read mode. So we've added a new kind of dependency, which is a data dependency on the Orange font package. And this is the reason why you should not write your data sets, whether they are fonts, images, or something else, in an overlay, because there is no package associated to an overlay, and you would not be able to write anything here. Having the data set in a file, in a package, sorry, will enable you to do such things. So, code, a very small snippet of the code that handles our uh, Apparmorph thing. A few macros that install things from the current package directory to the staging or to our target. Plus a few hooks that are registered automatically. And we've got something that handles pretty much everything from for elf files. And at the very end of the build, in a target finalized hook, we scan all F executables with a tool I we wrote that I even wrote, that uses the root directory staging output specifically for a speci a current, uh, the current binary, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we can only do that at the very end, because data dependencies are not actual build dependencies. That is, when the executable is installed, not all the snippets it depends on are installed yet. So we, c we have to postpone the scanning of an executable to, to the end of the build. And that's where we register it. But we don't regis register it in the target finalized hook. We register it in a specific hook that is called as a very specific moment during the build because it must come after the elf files are sanitized, but before the other, two, uh, other hooks we are calling. And I'm almost finished, only one slide, and then I can go to the conclusion. And so far we've been seeing how to hook into the various steps of a build of a package, or to hook at the target finalized hook into the infrastructure. But for some configurations, for some boards, you will want to call some local customizations. And for example, we have a post build script that will generate, for example, a an FHS compliant version file, remove some files that we do not want on the target. For example, all the uh, Dbus XML descriptions are absolutely useless on the target, so remove them. We also remove the .empty uh, placeholders because a Git tree does not track directories, so we have .empty files in there. A lot more other things. But you can use a post build script to do last minute fixes or cleanups in your uh, target directory. You can also provide many post build scripts. You can have a production one uh, that is always run, and you can have one that is only run in your test configurations. And for example, we have one that opens the dbus to onto TCP, so we can co uh, provoke, uh, sorry, we can call testing things via dbus from a remote m Jenkins job, for example. And this is conditional. If it is not already done, we do it. So as a conclusion, we've seen that we've been adding a lot of infrastructure. We've added more than that I've shown, but I'm already short on time. So adding an infrastructure allows things to be done automatically without the developer in, uh, doing calling specific tools. 
It's just in the make process. The developer calls make, and it has a firmware where all the stuff has have been executed. And most importantly, it's systematic because it's done the same way for all packages. And of course, because it is automatically done, it is reproducible, which is very important for embedded systems. And maintainable because it is written in single location. So if we need to fix it, we don't have to hunt all users of a specific tool to fix it. We just fix it in a single location. And finally, it is extendable because calling the orange package macro we have introduced will automatically pull in new features we add to this macro. And as a last point, as I asked my colleagues to come up with a wish list for build root, for extended build root, and I had no reply. So I think it, build root is okay, and there is nothing more to do with build root. We can stop working. Um, I think I have to be very fast. <laughs> if you have questions, please speak now or never to speak again. Any question? Yeah. Can you make the slides available somewhere? Yes, because I will. I'm a make idiot, and I have tried to write your built-in macros, and they never, never work for me. <laughs> so, so some sort of template that I can learn from would be really cool. Yeah, so I will be making the slides available on sked.com after the talk. Maybe not right now, but before the end of the week, yes. And also, just an, a slide, side note, all the code I've been working showing here is not complete the other stuff, but it gets an overview of what is possible. Here. Yeah. If you make a small change to your application, for example, add debug output, how long does the rebuild of the image take? So you mean if I just add... Debug output to, f to your application you want to package into the image, how long does the rebuild... Also well, it really depends on to what you mean, because if you just add a, a, few co a few lines of code of your application, maybe only the files that are modified are rebuilt, because we are using the override SSD uh, feature provided by BuildRoot okay. here. So a developer, when a developer changes the code, he has the code on a specific directory, which is copied by BuildRoot, and if you just change that code, you can ask Beirut make a package rebuild, and it will just copy, uh, rsync the code to the build directory, and only the files that have been modified will be copied. And so if the build system of your application is correctly written, like CMake or uh, things like that, only the new files will be rebuilt. So it's pretty fast. Thank you. Other question? Okay, so let's call it a, call it a day. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy uh, the boost crawl. Thank you. <laughs>